lovely plums, lovely juicy plums. Get your lovely juicy plums. Roll up then, roll up. We learnt a lot from the market. In particular, we learned how the price of what we had to sell affected the behaviour of the people we were trying to sell to, the consumers. We'd found that raising the price reduced the amount people wanted to buy. It acted as a sort of rationing system. Yeah, and on the other hand, we'd also found something else. Lowering the price of an item increased the amount people wanted to buy. It acted as an incentive. But the truth is, it isn't only the consumer whose behaviour changes as the price goes up and down. The producer's behaviour changes too. And our behaviour certainly changed. Mm. Phew. All right. Come and get it. Come and get it. Oh, forget it. It all began that day. I'd been out with the children. We'd walked further into the hills than I've ever been in my life before. And just guess what we found. Hmm, it really wasn't the time for guessing games. A cave. A cave? Hmm. Who wanted to talk about caves when the meal they'd been cooking all morning was stone cold? And the shawls they'd been making all week had to be got ready for the trader. I asked you if you knew what it was made of. Well? Well? Oh, who cared what a rotten old cave was made of if you knew that unless we sold the shawls to the trader, we'd have no money left for food, hot or cold? It was made of salt, dear. Oh, what was? The cave! The cave made of salt, I explained. That we could sell salt on the market. I felt sure that we'd do very nicely from it. Oh, who could possibly be so stupid? Mm. We already had enough salt to last us for a month. The trader brings sacks full every time he comes. It only costs ten cents a bowl. We couldn't possibly compete with his prices. Mm. Oh, you see, we'd starve unless we could think of something better than that. It was much better to make clothes and blankets. That way we got a decent amount of money for a decent day's work. You've got to admit I'm right. Yes, but all the same, I thought it was worth a try. After all, soon everybody would be wanting to salt down meat and fish for the winter. So I took my salt to the market the next day. But nobody took any notice of my salt. They said it was crazy to try and sell it at that price. I should have known, of course. My wife was quite right. She usually is. Yes. And since one of us had to earn some money, I took the shawls to the trader. And although we couldn't sell our salt at our asking price, people needed it badly. There was a crowd waiting to buy it from the trader, so they could preserve their fish and meat for the winter. But do you know what? There was a shock in store for everybody. The trader didn't have any salt, and he told us why. His village salt mine had caved in. It had been terrible. The whole tunnel was blocked. They didn't even have any salt for themselves, let alone enough for trading. Now, if we only knew where we could get some. Yes. If we only knew where. If we only knew where. I wonder... Just a minute. Where's she off to? Look. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Look. Oh, that's good stuff. Yes. Oh. Here you are. Oh, yes. Oh, that's lovely. Well, we got the message soon enough. You see, the whole of the village needed salt badly. No salt for the fish and meat surplus would mean that by next spring there'd be nothing left to eat. It was a long hike to the cave and hard work when we got there. But it was wonderfully clean, high-quality salt. Yeah. But the question was, would we be able to sell it at a price high enough to make all that effort worthwhile? And the answer was... 
could we not? Ho, ho, ho! Here they come! Yes, even at that price we could have sold ten times as much. So, naturally, we decided to get a whole load more of it. The trouble was, of course, we weren't the only people to realise that if you were on to salt, you were on to a good thing. We had company. Ooh, that awful shepherd family had caught on. Oh. They were all there, digging away at our salt. But even at 40 cents a bowl, salt was still well worth selling. Mm, but the trouble was, everybody else realised it. It soon began to look as though our whole village had turned to salt mining. Hmm. Yet the surprising thing was that the price of salt still made it worth our while to go through the trouble of fetching it from the caves. And another interesting thing was that now we'd stopped weaving, there were fewer shawls about and their price had got higher and higher. Things continued like that for a few days. Then the market seemed to have settled down. Prices didn't go up much. And they didn't go down much. The price of salt stayed at 15 cents a bowl. Stayed at 15 cents, that is, until our salt bubble burst. Yes, it was that trader again. Mm. They'd re-excavated their salt mine. And what's more, they'd found a rich new seam. Now he was offering it cheaper than ever. You what? Five cents a bowl? And there's plenty more where that came from. Oh, so there was only one thing left for us to do. Reduce the price yet again. Again, salted fish. Oh. Yes, salted fish again. Oh. Who wants to struggle five miles to a salt cave to dig for salt which scarcely brings in enough money to keep the children fed? But was there any alternative? Was there any alternative? And, and there, there it was! was. The price of shawls had made it worthwhile thinking about starting weaving again. So, I sat down at my loom and I began to work hard. Oh, I'd forgotten how much I enjoyed this. What happened on that occasion was this. When the supply of salt ran short, the prices rose and that encouraged more and more people to produce it. This increased the supply and as more and more salt appeared on the market, its price dropped, but soon it reached a stable level. Then, when the supply rose yet again, the salt miners found that it wasn't worth the effort and they stopped mining and went back to their previous job because it brought in more money than mining. Oh, oh. soon have this one finished. We saw in the last programme how the market was full of messages for the customer about the present state of supply. These are scarce here today, but those are plentiful. These are expensive and difficult to produce and distribute, but those are cheap and easy. And we saw how high prices ration scarce goods, while low prices clear plentiful goods. But the marketplace is simultaneously sending messages back to the producer about the present state of demand. A busy stall tells the producer people want more of these than they can get. On the other hand, a slack period in the market tells him people don't want these very much. With the result that high prices stimulate increased production and low prices cause reduced production. So, price is always acting to encourage producers to produce the right balance of what customers want to consume and to keep adjusting to every change in supply and every change in demand. It happens everywhere. Behind every price in a store, there is a volume of information, experience, calculation and judgement. The manufacturer has worked out his production costs, estimated how many he could sell at various prices and picked the price that gives him the biggest profit. But he's competing with all the other manufacturers and if his sales volume starts to drop, the message will get back to him fast. If it's a big change, it may mean a big rethink and a big change in the price. It might even put him out of business. 
a lot of manufacturers of hand-wound watches had to do a big rethink when electronic watches came onto the market at a fraction of the price. But it also works the other way. In the 1970s, during the UK bread strike, bread prices shot up. But people still wanted to buy bread. This stimulated others to hire trucks and import loaves from Holland. At the normal price, transport costs were too high to make bread importing worth anyone's while. But when scarcity doubled the price, it was a very different story. In the same way, the quadrupling of world oil prices in 1974 made other kinds of energy production more attractive to producers. Offshore oil, coal, nuclear power, wind power, they all had been rated too expensive, but that only meant compared with oil. So when oil prices shot up, it became worth people's while to pay the extra production and distribution costs because they could now charge prices they never could have charged when oil was cheap. The high oil price did what high prices always do, discouraged and rationed the consumer, but encouraged and stimulated the producer. What happens is this. When the price is high, people are encouraged to produce a lot. But after the first rush, you won't get many customers because the high price puts them off. You'll have a lot of unsold goods. As the price drops, fewer people think it's worth producing, but more people think it's worth buying, and so it goes on. About here, you reach a point of balance. A price which stimulates the production of just about the amount that customers will buy at that price. If the price goes on downwards, more and more producers will be discouraged. But at each falling price stage, more and more people will want the goods. That's when you get fights, queues and black markets. This price, the one in the middle, is called the equilibrium price. The price most goods settle down at. So, just as we saw in the last programme that there's a law of demand, there's an equally important law of supply. It's this. The higher the price offered, the greater the quantity supplied. Or if you prefer, the lower the price offered, the smaller the quantity supplied. And, like the law of demand, the law of supply applies to this and every other market you can think of.